Good morning, everyone. Well, I know that folks are still trickling in, but in the interest of time, I think we're going to get started today. So thank you so much for joining us for the Co-Creating Evidence, a digital handbook on wraparound programs webinar hosted by the Nota Bene Consulting Group, Center of Excellence for Women's Health, and the Canada FASD Research Network. My name is Lindsay Wolfson. I'm the research manager at the Center of Excellence for Women's Health and a researcher at the Canada FASD Research Network, and we are so grateful to have you join us today. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that we are joining from the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island. We want to begin by acknowledging the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis as peoples as the first inhabitants and traditional custodians of the land in which we live, learn, work, and play. And as we gather from across Turtle Island, we want to recognize that we are presenting from the traditional and unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, including the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples, and the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabwaki, Mississaugas of the Credit, First Nation, Mississauga, Wendaki Niam Wincento, and Atikmashing, Anishinaabeg. We pay our respects to the elders past, present, and emerging from across the lands in which we gather. We also want to acknowledge the Indigenous and non-Indigenous women who contributed to this work, including Marilyn Van Bibber, who you'll be hearing from later today, and the program staff and participants who co-create or who contributed to the co-creating evidence project. Before we begin, Julie, the Center of Excellence for Knowledge or for Women's Health Knowledge Translation Lead, and I will walk through the agenda, some housekeeping items, and briefly introduce today's presenters. What you see here is that today we'll provide an overview of the co-creating evidence project, introduce the digital handbook, which was um, produced to support the development, operation, and sustainability of wraparound programs for pregnant and early parenting women and gender diverse people with substance use and related concerns, and then to spend some time walking through three of the topic areas in the digital handbook, including topic one, which is about wraparound programs, Topic three about trauma informed practice, and topic seven wraparound programs in indigenous indigenous cultural programming, and we'll wrap up with a Q and A today. So I'll pass it over to Julie now, who's just going to talk a little bit about housekeeping before we get started. Thanks, Lindsay. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. So during the webinar, your microphones will be muted and your cameras turned off. If you have any questions for the panelists, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. The webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to all registrants after the webinar takes place. It will also be made available on the Center of Excellence for Women's Health website at cewh.ca. And if you have any other questions, feel free to reach us at the email provided here. So that's bccewh at gmail.com. Or you can contact myself or the CEWH producer using the chat function during the webinar. We want to acknowledge funding for this project has been received from the Public Health Agency of Canada, Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder National Strategic Project Fund and the views expressed here on it do not necessarily represent the views of Public Health Agency of Canada. And so our presenters today are Deborah Rutman, Carol Hubbardsty, Marilyn Van Bibber, and Nancy Poole. Deborah, Carol, Marilyn are principals at the Nota Bene Consulting Group, in addition to leading the co-creating evidence project. And recent projects include creating evaluation maps for FASD prevention, and support programs, promising approaches in working with women with FASD and substance use issues, Indigenous child and family service practice models, and program evaluation of Eat Sleep Console, Her Way Home, and the BC Key Worker Program. Nancy Poole is the director at the Center of Excellence for Women's Health and a prevention lead at, for the Canada FASD Research Network and a partner with Nota Bene on this project. So I will now pass it over to Carol, who will speak more about the co-creating evidence evaluation project. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, 
Yeah, just to, I just wanted to say briefly, uh, yes, fund this pro project, the co-creating evidence evaluation project, uh, which was initiated in 2017, was funded by PHAC. This is the final wrap up, um, se second stage of that evaluation. And we did partner and work very closely with Nancy Poole and her team at the Center of uh, Excellence for Women's Health. And I'm just mentioning that because as we go through the, the digital handbook, you'll see that partnerships are an essential part of uh, wraparound programs and partnerships are an essential part of our work too, particularly working with, the, with Nancy and her team. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, this one just shows you the, uh, the uh, sites of the, the co-creating evidence project evaluation. So it was a, this was a first of its kind uh, national evaluation. As you see here, it involved eight multi-service programs serving women at high risk of having an infant uh, who had been prenatally exposed to alcohol or other substances. The important and unique part about this evaluation is that the eight programs taking part in the study were all different. And they all were developed in response to local influences and issues. So this was not a study of one model distributed nationally. It was an evaluation that involved eight different programs. You can see them there starting in the West, Victoria, Her Way Home, Vancouver, She Way, uh, one of the very first two of these kinds of programs, uh, uh, Surrey, Maxine Wright, Edmonton, the Her Pregnancy Program, Regina, uh, Raising Hope, which was a housing-based, the only housing-based uh, program, in Winnipeg, the Mothering Project, in Toronto, Breaking the Cycle, another of the very uh, early programs of this type, also well-known, and in New Glasgow, uh, Baby Basics. Um, the four programs, four of the programs were operated by health authorities, four were operated by a community-based agency. In terms of what we did, uh, we did interviews with clients, staff, and service partners two times over 18 months. Um, and then we also received program and client snapshot data from the programs every three months for 18 months. If you wanted to know more about the, the whole uh, project and the evaluation report, it is on the Center of Excellence website, and, and Lindsay will give you that link later on. If we move to the next slide. So what are wraparound programs? This is a, a diagram, a figure, uh, whatever, that we developed um, out of the co-creating evidence uh, uh, project, out of the research. Um, and it, to really depict that in a practical sense, wraparound means that multiple services are offered uh, through one location. So instead of sending a, a, a participant, program participant or a client to, to make to multiple services to, to meet their needs, you instead bring those services to one location. So in a symbolic sense, and as we try to depict in this diagram, you wrap uh, programs, uh, you wrap care around the, the mother-child unit. And so some of the things that, the, the programs didn't all provide all of these services, but overall, these are the services uh, that were found to be uh, uh, important and that um, the, the program participants really um, looked for and relied on. So food and nutrition was a key one. Basic needs could be clothing, uh, toys for children, help with housing, uh, making applications. A big piece of it was the access, uh, help with uh, child welfare or custody issues. Um, not to forget the children either, that there were referrals to uh, for children's health assessment, referrals to uh, for diagnosis, et cetera, for if there were any kind of speech or other kinds of issues or health issues. Pre and postnatal health and women's health were all part of that, as was cultural programming. These were urban programs and uh, half of them, the majority of um, program participants were indigenous. The cultural programming was very uh, important in that set, uh, in those settings. So you can see the the wraparound. And this is why we also talk about the need for partnerships. These programs did not try to do it all themselves. They they tried, they did it with 
with um, uh, support from uh, other in-kind contributions, contracted staff, staff from other agencies that might be on site for one or two days a week and co-located services. We could go to the next slide. One of the things that we did is that we asked uh, program participants what they hope to gain from participating in their particular program and then what the most significant change was as a result. And you can see from this uh, diagram in terms of the, the um, top themes that um, the interconnectedness of their lives. So while obtaining help with substances use was the top goal, their additional motivations included wanting more information, wanting support or assistance with child welfare, with pregnancy and housing and getting connected to healthcare or prenatal care and opportunities for peer support. That was really important. And you can see that from the significant change uh, diagram there too, when they talked about what had changed in their lives, it maps very nicely to the things that they had been looking for. And again, you know, that increased connection to community, peer and culture is, is uh, an important piece of this. This is not just about substance use or just about healthcare. The next one. In terms of practice implications, um, you know, I think this sort of this slide is is somewhat self uh, self evident that it's you know that that one stop wraparound services is really important. You can't kind of hide off issues and say here you know we can only we support you in this issue, but you have to go there for those issues, um, and that. A really fun, uh, fundamental piece of this is that having knowledgeable and empathetic program staff and a well conceptualized evidence based theoretical foundation. We spent time with those programs at the very beginning before we uh, launched the evaluation to help define what that theoretical foundation was that they were all working from. Strong partnership relationships, key Indigenous cultural reconnection and connection, and then opportunities for community support. So if we were to go, if we go to the next slide, so that's just a thumbnail sketch of the co-creating evidence uh, project, uh, evaluation project. <laughs> From that came a number of articles, but uh, in the second phase, uh, this indigenous, uh, sorry, this digital uh, handbook, which um, we have, uh, we're pleased to launch today. The did um, just to say, by the way, uh, so that I don't forget that a French version of this will be completed by the end of February. So the digital handbook is based on uh, fifteen topics. It's it's it was developed with multiple audiences in mind. Uh, you can find it if you go to the next slide, Lindsay. You can find it on the co-creating evidence website. As by the way, you will also find the evaluation uh, report from the co-creating evidence uh, project evaluation study, but the course itself, it's called a course here because that's how it's set up on the center's website, is under webinars and courses um, and the co-creating evidence wraparound program, you see it there, but it is a, it's a handbook, it's not a course, it's developed with multiple audiences in mind so program planners, managers and staff, service partners from a variety of health and social sectors, funders, researchers, community members, et cetera. And we think it also will have multiple uses. Because it's developed as a handbook and not a course, the 15 topics are topics that individuals can pick up and go through as, as they want. It's not a sequential kind of thing. So you don't have to start at topic one and work your way through topic 15. You can pick up, pick and choose. Um, we think that this will be useful for staff training, uh, for onboarding new staff, for anybody who's interested in research and or developing a, a similar kind of program. The topics are based on our research of the C with the CCE evaluation study, but they it's not just that. We drew as well from experts in the field. There is a bit of an emphasis on Canadian evidence and knowledge. Uh, you'll see there that we also, uh, we have um, a number of topics that are around practice. So trauma-informed practice, relationship-based practice, 
culturally safe care, et cetera, harm reduction. But we also broaden it, look at it more broadly. So we talk about uh, evaluation, program challenges and opportunities, data collection, partnerships, you know, what difference do these make, et cetera. So, so again, that's where you can see from this list of topics that this is not, that the, there's a wide audience in mind. Um, and, and people uh, can go to these topics dependent on where they're located and, and what their particular issue is. Each topic has a similar structure. It begins with a note about the handbook and language. It has a list of areas covered in that particular topic. And then it ends with a knowledge check, reflection and discussion question. So for example, uh, you know, if you're um, having a staff team meeting and your, you know, uh, education is a piece of what you do in the staff team meeting, you might choose a topic and have those knowledge uh, 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 reflection and discussion questions as part of your topic. It could also be used for onboarding uh, new staff. And again, can be used in different settings, not just in a wraparound program. We've also heard from others that this would be useful in a hospital setting where they might be doing something along the lines of um, uh, eat, sleep, and console kind of uh, 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 service in the, the uh, maternity units. So it's, um, I think that's all that I have to say about this because now uh, Marilyn, Deb, and Nancy are going to talk about three of those topics in more detail. So they'll really give you a better understanding about how the handbook works. The other thing I just wanted to add is that we also tried to make this interactive. And again, when they go through, you'll see how, how we've uh, done that. So I'm gonna turn this over now to Deb to talk about topic number one. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Julie, as well, for uh, um, all that you've said up till now. Really appreciate that. And so excited to uh, be able to launch our um, our digital handbook made with uh, lots of love and so many people have contributed, as has been said. So I want to take an opportunity to walk us through the very first topic. Before I do that, I'm going to mention something that I think is kind of important, um, is that this is free, free to access, free for anybody. So, um, you know, as a, a really important point in terms of those multiple audiences, um, it can, you can come back to it, you can, you can start it, you can stop it, you can come back to a different topic or delve in deeper to the one that you started before. Uh, we really, really wanted to do to create something that was going to be as accessible as possible to the multiple audiences that we think um, could could potentially be benefiting from this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this very first uh, topic, and we call them topics, um, not modules, but um, you know the topic one, the introduction. So thank you, Lindsay, for just scrolling gently to the very beginning. Carol mentioned that each topic began with a note, a couple of notes. One is about the handbook, and that's just a reminder about how it was created and the fact that it is connected to the co-creating evidence project and that much of the content is drawing on that project or on the foundational wisdom and um, evidence that, um, you know, that, that was uh, bent, that the project benefited from, largely created through many of the programs that participated in the co-creating evidence project. We also have a note about language. Um, and um, I think that Lindsay will be putting in the chat the uh, this actual first paragraph about this note about language and how we are referring to the the program participants. Um, they were uh, their pregnant women, mothers, people, clients, patients, um, and that our intent is always to acknowledge and be inclusive of transgender, two spirited, gender diverse, and non binary people who are pregnant and parenting. Um, beyond that, uh, if you could scroll down, Lindsay, just a little bit. As Carol mentioned, each of the topics starts with um, a, essentially a contents page. So for this first one, 
um, this orientation, if you will, on what, what are wraparound programs or an intro to wraparound programs. We have the introduction. We have some discussion about what is a wraparound program for pregnant and parenting women with substance use and complex concerns. And I think Carol spoke to that quite uh, nicely. We also provide some really important contextual information that situates women's substance use and clients' reasons for participating in their program, as well as the service barriers that exist for women who use substances. And then the fourth part here is using a social determinants of health approach in service delivery related to women's substance use, wraparound programs, and FASD prevention. So again, each of these are sub topics or areas within this first topic on the intro to wraparound programs. And lastly, as Carol mentioned, each topic has a what we call a knowledge check. There are reflection and discussion questions. They can be used individually by the user. They can be used in team discussions. Um, they can be used for training purposes. So they're just trying to get us thinking about the content um, and the meaning of the content in that topic, and then a key concepts review. So, uh, Lindsay, if you can just scroll then um, gently down to um, the first place we were going to stop. So there's the diagram that Carol referred to and the discussion about what is this. Also, just to mention, brief tiny stop there, if that's okay, Lindsay, that we do um, embed throughout this topic, throughout all the topics, resources with hyperlinks to references that people may find useful if they want to dig deeper and, and delve into that content in more depth. Thank you, Lindsay, if we could continue. So Carol provided us with um, the, uh, a bit of the graphic, um, which is actually a figure within the uh, co-creating evidence report about what women hope to get from participating in their program, as well as what were the top themes that came out of what they actually did say were the most significant changes uh, when, when participating. What we wanted to show here was how this, um, how this software actually has an interactive component. So we presented this figure with what women hope to get from participating in their program. But Lindsay, if you'd be kind enough to just pop up, you can see, and this is based on the co-creating evidence study, these are the, the, the um, program participants' own words. So when they were interested in support for their, um, getting support for their programmatic substance use or trauma, these are their, their quotes that they said. They wanted to get sober. They wanted their children back, their family back. They were using drugs and alcohol, but they were going through a rough time, breaking up with their partner who was abusive mentally and emotionally. So we won't go through each quote in turn, but it allows the user just to um, engage with the material in a more um, interactive way than if we were just to put it as a, a more static graphic. And so throughout the uh, 15 topics, each topic has interactive aspects to them. They uh, sometimes embed a PDF that somebody can access. They embed film. They actually also provide, they, the, each topic provides links to other websites that may be something of interest. If you could continue on to our next place that we were gonna stop. Um, this is a film. So the last part that I wanted to stop on here before getting to the reflective questions was really talking about the importance of language. We wanted to include this in this introduction to wraparound programs. This is actually an infographic that was produced by the Canada FASD Research Network team. Really important information about the importance of language in speaking about alcohol and pregnancy and people who are, um, who are using alcohol during pregnancy. And so this um, infographic is both embedded here in static form, but we also provide you with a link back to the FASD Canada, uh, Canada FASD Research Network. So you can yourself 
um, you know, um, lift up that uh, or, or uh, download that graphic and then have that for your own uses as a user of this um, digital handbook. And then to the last place, Lindsay, if you'd be so kind. Again, more resources, speaking about the social determinants of health aspects and the importance of that. And then the, and this is again, just wanted to illustrate that for each topic, including this one, the intro to um, wraparound programs, we have a knowledge check. We have a few, ref, you know, reflective questions really to start your thinking off. Um, you can be adding others in your team meetings or in your training or your personal reflections. And then lastly, we have three or four key points for that topic as takeaways. Um, just a little bit more scrolling, if that's okay, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Um, just to kind of boil it down, um, just as a bit of a reminder of um, the summary of each topic. So that's uh, my bit about the intro to wraparound programs. And I'm going to pass this over to Nancy to talk about trauma and informed practice. Thanks, Deb. So I had the opportunity to kind of pull together the info for the trauma informed section from the work of the programs. And, you know, as many of you may know, I've been thinking, reading and writing about trauma informed practice over the past decade. And I've had the opportunity to work with the Justice Institute of BC and many governments across Canada, plus the organizations um, such as the co-creating evidence ones. So trauma-informed approaches are really being integrated into many systems of care, with each group of service providers and service users finding ways to adapt to their context and issues and needs. And so, you know, to begin with, you know, I just really want to acknowledge the importance of trauma-informed practice in the work of pregnancy outreach programs and wraparound program providers. And I, I just feel like their role is particularly key um, in doing things in a trauma-informed way, given the tremendous stigma and the very challenging lives that many of the women who come to these programs um, have experienced. So really uh, great to have the opportunity to make a module that digs a bit deeper into, um, into the work um, uh, in this context. So if, as Lindsay goes down here, you'll see that you know, we really have built the trauma-informed practice um, piece around principles and applying principles of um, care and putting it specifically um, into the pregnancy outreach program context. Now, here's the four principles. We're not going to really stop here for long, but you can see it has a similar thing to what Deb pointed out in terms of the um, the interactivity that you can actually learn more about each of these. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lindsay. But I think, you know, really, I just wanted to mention it in the context of these programs and, you know, how people are enacting the safety and trustworthiness principle, bringing in this idea of non judgmental um, approaches and um, and doing, you know, giving the opportunity to talk about substance use and, and what women want to do as their plans for harm reduction and recovery um, without feeling like they're going to be reported to the powers that be, but they're actually going to be able to be in a relational and trauma-informed uh, process together with the providers and sorting out what will be um, important for them. And I think, you know, that relational way is so reparative of having experience of trauma. And the choice and collaboration and connection piece, really critical. And just seeing that these relationships with peers in the program and with the providers are really the foundation through which change is made and through which choices can be made. 
And lots of work, um, many of the programs were amazing in terms of the strengths-based and skill-building aspect that is part of trauma-informed, helping people with building skills for centering and calming, et cetera. And they did that in so many ways, and um, including grounding activities, but also drumming and smudging and walking and many other ways as well. So most of the rest of this module is really about giving you all kinds of ideas about trauma-informed practice in the context of wraparound programs, um, really learning lots more about um, you know, these resources where there are so many excellent resources, including those ones she's just passing by now from Breaking the Cycle, and many others from uh, all kinds of areas across Canada that um, I think are really excellent resources for thinking through what it means. But I wanted to finally just stop here and point out that in the course of the co-creating evidence study, the client satisfaction surveys were done. And part of the client satisfaction surveys really did try to capture, are we being trauma-informed? And I just wanted to show some of the kinds of questions you can see that went behind there, where women were able to signal to the providers, do they feel emotionally safe? Um, are they, are staff sensitive when asking about difficult experiences? Um, do they feel they can trust those who are working at the program, um, et cetera? You know, do they think the program offers choice about services? And do they, you know, feel that their needs uh, were really being met? And I think you know, it's such a great insight into, you know, how, how, in, how easily we can really get information from service users who need to be really close partners with us in understanding about whether we are achieving the goal of providing trauma-informed programs. So, that's all I wanted to say about it, other than there is a second uh, topic farther down um, the list of topics that really talks about the wellness of staff as well, which is uh, the other key aspect of being trauma-informed is that your staff are well. And you saw from what um, Carol and Deb said that it really mattered to the women. Uh, um, uh, a key practice was that the staff were empathetic. And uh, so, you know, this part of the programming, I think, is so important. And I hope people have the opportunity to um, dig more deeply in. I'll turn it over to you, Marilyn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to be here with, with all of you. I see we have 101 people that are um, at this launch. Um, so I wanted to begin by uh, really um, saying thank you to the, the women that shared their stories and the, um, the staff that we, we got to know over, you know, three years of, of uh, being in touch with, with the different um, programs across Canada. It has been, um, it has been such an honor and a pleasure to be part of this, this project. So I'm going to speak to you and we're going to walk through uh, topic number seven, which is wraparound programs and Indigenous cultural programming. And um, so, I'll give you a brief overview of this and uh, we'll just look at the, the topic areas are, um, first of all, the, the introduction, um, cultural programming as a resource, as a feature to the um, wraparound programs and in particular four of the wraparound programs that were part of the uh, co-creating evidence. And then a look at partnerships. Um, it's already been said that um, the um, 
the success of, of the wraparound programs has a lot to do with the, with the programs that the, the um, partners that have been involved. And then looking at the, the benefits of the Indigenous cultural programming. And lastly, the knowledge check reflections and discussion. So this model, this topic is laid out in the same way as the others that you have um, been heard about this morning. Um, so this topic is provides both discussion and resources that relate to Indigenous cultural programming as a resource um, to health, as well as it is resources that can support the development of Indigenous cultural programming within wraparound programs for pregnant and parenting women with substance use and other complex issues. And I would go further than that to say that um, this model could actually, actually be used for, for other, other groups involved. Um, so most of the, um, all but one I should say, of the, uh, the programs involved in, in the wraparound study um, are situated in cities and therefore the, um, the women, the, the participants are coming from diverse cultures, including Indigenous women are coming from, from diverse cultures. So um, what we wanted to do in terms of the looking at uh, cultural programming as a resource is that um, within Indigenous programming, whether it's First Nations, Inuit, or Métis, um, there are so many excellent resources. So we picked um, we picked a few of them, and um, one is the. Um, I think we've gone a little further. One is that uh, I wanted to make mention of is um, the uh, Dr. Judith Bartlett, who actually was uh, on the board for the FASD um, network. And um, she developed a indigenous determinants of health framework. So we've made a link to, uh, to that, as well as, um, as uh, BC's First Nation Health Authority, their wellness framework. And, um, and we also included a video clip of uh, Sila Watts Kulche, and she's speaking about Inuit people and the snow and the land as teachers of, of life's wisdom and life skills, as well as the connection of, of the health of the people and the health of the planet. So it's, it's very timely to include these kinds of resources when we're talking about next generations. The next section um, highlights um, programming from four of, of the sites, as I mentioned. And the first one that we stop at is um, the, HER, the HER program. And what I wanted to say about HER is um, this is health empowerment and resilience. And it's a, it's a program out of Edmonton, downtown Edmonton. And um, the outreach staff are, are all Indigenous and have lived experience. And so I just wanted to read to you the quote that, that is there from one of the staff members. Staff have lived it. They have a lot of lived experience. They understand their clients and what they're going through. And so they're better able to work with them. The HER workers offer so much support. They go above and beyond. Women see and feel that. I've seen so many women with light in their eyes and hope and who are raising their children. They have opportunity and hope to raise their children. So, and just as an aside, I want to say that we are recently working on a little um, booklet that we, we want to be able to give to the, the, the different projects that have been involved. And the title of it comes from one of the mothers that, that spoke, and she spoke about having the opportunity to keep her child. And she said, all I needed was a mustard seed of hope. 
And um, so we've built this little booklet around that, um, um, that message. And um, so that's the HER program. The, um, we passed by the, um, um, the Raising Hope and what they have done, the Raising Hope have, as mentioned, um, it is a housing based project and that they partnered with an indigenous, oh, my time is up. <laughs> they, they partnered with an indigenous uh, housing organization. Um, I'd like to just say that the mothering program in Winnipeg has um, a, a healing room, a sacred space that is used by both um, women and their families and clients. One woman spoke about, you know, being able to go in and smudge and that helped, helped her with her day. Um, and uh, Nancy spoke about the importance of workplace wellness and to be able to use a sacred space like that for the staff has been very, um, has been a very welcome resource for them. Chiwe, as you know, is one of the oldest of the programs and um, they have ceremonies such as uh, baby welcoming and water ceremonies that's open to all people. About 70% of the women who attend Chiwe when we were there um, are in indigenous. Um, and also I'd like to mention that the elders that come to Chiwe as well as to other of the sites have been a major resource for both the women as well as the, um, the staff. So um, I wanted to say something about partnerships. Uh, my time has run out. I think that it's already very clear that the partnerships for um, all of the programs has been um, so very vital in, in helping to bring uh, cultural programming. And um, so the last scrolling is down to the, um, the reflective questions. I will not go through those just to, just to highlight that, that they are there and uh, hopefully to spur some further discussions and with this, uh, with this particular topic. Thank you very much. I have one more thing to say. They put me last because the last time I took up all the time when we did a practice run on this. <laughs> Thank Not you. Not true, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> we can listen to you forever, Marilyn. Um, it's so um, it's so interesting. Um, so, uh, Julie and Lindsay, I don't see any open uh, questions here. So maybe we could just talk a bit more and people can feel uh, welcome to post questions in, uh, in the Q&A section um, as, we, uh, as we have a bit of uh, uh, discussion. I think... Sorry, Nancy, I was just gonna say, and maybe use that as a friendly reminder. I know I can see a few people raising their hands. We do have everyone muted. So we really encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box and we can um, answer um, live that way. Great, thank you. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I think is important um, to, to mention, and it ties into what Marilyn was just saying about partnerships and what Deb was saying about the wraparound uh, concept, is that while these programs to, you know, in, to various degrees provided one stop um, wraparound support, it's recognized that some organizations may need to build connections among services within their communities. They won't be able to put it all in one place. But I think these principles we've talked about kind of apply uh, across um, 
across all communities, whether they're small or large, that you can bring in elders to make it more one stop, or you can connect people to go in to the Mother Goose readings at the local Friendship Center, knowing that you have a partnership with to provide those same kinds of trauma-informed, culturally safe, uh, you know, harm-reducing oriented um, philosophies within all the programs in your network. So I think it's just really, um, really important that people know that you don't have to have the have it all. Um, you can make a connected hub of services as well to deliver this wraparound type program. So I see someone has a question about what we hope to see in practice after this research. Um, and I don't know um, what all our hopes are, um, that people will be inspired, of course. I don't know, Deb, do you want to answer, start off by answering what we hope to see in practice? <laughs> That's a really great question. Thank you for the question, Tiana. Um, I don't know that there is just one thing. We know that, um, we know that programs uh, are working so very, very hard um, and at the same time are always looking for additional resources and the opportunities to learn and to learn from one another. And sometimes in the very, very busy lives of staff and programs, um, you know, I think our hope is that for those that are either start looking to start something or to think through um, how they might, you know, connect better or differently with other resources and services and, and supports in their community, we're hoping that this provides some of those resources through um, learning and connecting. I think that the whole project over the last few years has been, as Marilyn said, I think that wonderful opportunity and very privileged opportunity for us um, to, uh, to, to develop those connections and to help the programs learn from one another. So I, I just think this is a, you know, a, a resource that can help people um, you know, learn to go a little bit deeper um, to not feel that they're alone, that they're not working in isolation, um, and, you know, to know that there's support out there. Uh, that would be my hope for some of this. It's not super specific, but um, I think that was our intent in trying to put this together. Carol, did you want to add anything? Well, just to say, I think, as I mentioned before, that the this digital handbook and these topics are not just for wraparound programs. We have heard, uh, uh, for example, that um, you know some of this may be useful for um, uh, practice in uh, some of the mother baby units in BC where they're implementing eat, sleep, and console, um, which has to do with uh, uh, a specific practice for. Uh, uh, women who have substance use, who are pregnant, sub using have substance use issues, and uh, you know, and and um, wherein they're trying a different way of, uh, of working with the 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 parent, the mom, the parent, and the baby. Um, so it does not practice is not just around. It's not just about practice within a wraparound program. I think it it can be broadly applied in any setting, wherein. Um, you're coming into contact with the issues of, of perinatal substance use, prenatal substance use, uh, mm -hmm. and, and other kinds of the kinds of yeah. things that we've talked about here. And I, I guess I think we're, um, uh, Carol, particularly about the CAPC and CPMP programs, these small, wonderful programs all across Canada that don't necessarily, like Ethel says here, have a lot of 
uh, money to do this kind of work themselves to to boost their practice but when you know when they can access it um and uh from others who have put it down on paper it, or in the internet i think it's just a really important challenge because those programs so often are you know not not well funded, but really trying to reach families in a trustworthy, trauma informed way in the communities. And hopefully, you know, these kinds of resources can really um, can really boost uh, their their work and give them some things to draw from and discuss as they, you know, continue to offer this this work. Um, what other questions do we have here? Um, strategies in the handbook that address engagement and keeping participants engaged. Marilyn, do you wanna start off that discussion about holding people in? Wow, that's an interesting one. Um, well, I, I do know that um, one of the most common um, comments made by the women was the was the importance of staff being non-judgmental and um, you know and being treated with dignity and respect. So um, and also it's you know it's part of the the harm reduction and and the trauma informed in that um, they can always come back. Um, mm. I think that Carol or Deb may have more to say on this. I do wanna say on the last question though, that um, I would like to see, uh, I'd be very interested to see how a wraparound program could, um, could be developed in a small community uh, coming from, from the Yukon and, and a small community. Um, and where the resources are centered in, in Whitehorse, for, Whitehorse, for example, and very few services are there. So how, how do you create that, that wraparound? And, um, you know, maybe it's going back and remembering what, what systems we had in place in the past. So um, I think also in terms of engagement, I would, I would mention uh, in terms of culture, that is one way of, of engaging um, Indigenous women. In fact, women of, of many different cultures um, can, can enjoy and benefit from, from the different activities that are taking place in these, in these uh, programs. Yeah. That's what I really felt, Marilyn. That's why I threw that question at you first, because I think the offering of Indigenous um, programming really is a draw in and a, a place of, of safety for uh, and engagement for Indigenous women and uh, uh, as well as having that overall sense that you can come and take what you need and you're not going to be told what to do. <laughs> Right, that you're you're more choosing your what you need. Yeah, over to yeah. You. yeah, yeah. No, a couple of thoughts. One is that um, again, I don't know, Lindsay, if it's possible to put up just the uh, the wraparound Nautilus uh, diagram while we're answering this. But one of the things that certainly comes to mind for me in drawing on the work of the co-creating evidence uh, study is um, is the fact that these programs are, um, you know, do come from that place of a social determinants of health perspective as well. So while they're, um, you know, their focus may be working with, with women or pregnant people with um, substance use and other concerns, those other concerns, whether the need for safe, uh, secure housing or child welfare related issues, or even basic needs and food nutrition. I think those are really, really important aspects of these programs. Uh, women know that, I mean, you know, certainly at least pre-COVID when the programs were all open and often had drop-in or had, um, you know, a meal every day, a place, a safe place for women and their kids to come. 
um, that that's hugely important um, and, and is a way to begin the conversation about what else is going on in their lives, what are their other sort of hopes and dreams and needs. And that is, again, kind of connects us to those approaches, those key approaches of being relational, being non-judgmental and respectful. And that's why I wanted to put up the, this uh, image to show you that in addition to the different service areas that are offered by these wraparound programs, we also have in between the, the key um, approaches um, I don't know if you'd call them strategies, but what we call is, you know, core foundational, um, you know, uh, uh, um, principles or, or ways of working and being that were so fundamentally important for the programs and that I think really uh, promoted their uh, ability to engage and to sustain participants over time. Mm. Um, I want to answer the question that Dolores has just posted, um, even though there's lots more we could say about this one. Um, and I just think it's um, really interesting to me how much we learned about the importance of harm reduction oriented approaches around the substance use part in the programs. And many of the programs offered groups for women to take strength from each other around substance use issues. They didn't necessarily impose that you have to get to abstinence, even though obviously that's the, the gold standard. And women were at various stages of recovery and whatever, but one of the things they mentioned was just how much they got from being connected to other women in the program who were at different stages of recovery. And we used to think that, you know, oh, you know, when you're trying to be absent, that you don't want to be anywhere near the people who are not yet. But in fact, women really could um, found, we found that they really could benefit from that, that they could see where they had been, they could see maybe where they were aiming to go in other women, and that that, that was a strength of the programs, these connecting to others um, who were also trying to address their substance use, but in very different ways. And some of them, as Deb mentioned, may have been starting with really trying to get housing or really concentrated on nutrition or other aspects that the wraparound offered. But as, uh, uh, those things contributed to them being able to make change in the substance use. And that when we really look at, at, at as a social determinants of health way, it makes such a difference and really allowing peers to be peers at all in all their diversity. So it was it was fascinating that Dolores and I think it's a really important part of these programs. Just to really and just to add to that, um, you know, we had the opportunity with the co-creating evidence to visit each program twice over the course of 18 months. And one of the things that we saw was that the programs are shifting and changing and being very, very responsive to the emerging needs and preferences of program participants. And so, you know, that very dilemma about working, um, um, developing peer supports, but recognizing that people are in different places are things that play out at the program level as well. And so back to the um, digital handbook, people might wanna have a look at even the section, the topic that we have about evaluation, because in that we include ways that program uh, staff, managers, planners can be doing ongoing, uh, you know, sort of quality improvement, if you will, or at least the opportunity to keep on um, asking client uh, pro program participants how this is working for them what needs to shift so things are not static and i think that really gets to your point nancy and to the points that uh, dolores is raising about this as well yeah 
Well, we have to wrap up. Um, thanks, Betty and Linda, for posting what you have. And yes, I agree. These can be used for nurses as well and, and, and all kinds of other folks. So uh, yeah, I'll turn it back over to you, Lindsay, to, uh, to do the wrap up and, and, and Kirsten. Absolutely. Thank you all. Um, as a reminder, it's in the chat, but um, please feel free to visit the center website. It's where the digital handbook is available. If you are somebody more familiar with the CanFast website, it's also available there. Um, so lots of ways that you are able to access it. And I know we didn't get to all of the questions. So here are the email addresses. Um, and again, the websites of both um, folks from the Center of Excellence for Women's Health and also Nota Bene. Um, I want to give a big thank you again to all the presenters for this wonderful information. As we said, a recording will be made available on the center's website. It will be promoted on um, the Women, Girls, and Alcohol blog, and I anticipate on a CanFast blog as well. And another thank you to CanFast for co-sponsoring this webinar with the Center of Excellence for Women's Health and Nota Bene. Kirsten, I'm going to pass it over to you for upcoming events from CanFast, things to look out for. Thanks, Lindsay, and thank you to all the presenters today for sharing your wealth of knowledge for, with everyone. Um, I just want to draw everyone's attention to. So Kirsten's email or internet has been cutting out, so I will be her voice. Um, <laughs> the next uh, CanFast webinar will be February 24th at 11 Mountain Time about so a couple things. I'm going to take over just because your internet's cutting um, <laughs> the conversation about correctional services and FASD and uh, CANFAS is also co-sponsoring a national um, FASD conference, but it is November 7th to 9th in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. More information be can be found on the CANFAS website. Thank you all again, and uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day.